On Hawks Postcast, part of Locked On Atlanta on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Hawks Postcast. Your home for the best Atlanta Hawks talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste, and alongside me is Deshaun Tate. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And, of course, our Locked On Hogs postcast is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, the Hawks mounted an unbelievable comeback earlier in the week, but weren't able to do quite the same thing tonight. We'll talk about some of the ways that that didn't happen for the Hawks as we break it down quarter by quarter in the end one. And we'll look ahead to a pivotal showdown in Chicago for these Hawks in Who's Got Next. But first, T and Tate talk about the Hawks 122-113 loss to the Bucks. And Deshaun, you said the inactives for the Hawks tell the story of this game. Absolutely. And f- first, let me start with this. I think it was really hard. And I think we mentioned this going into the, was it Portland game? I feel like it was after the first win against Boston, talking about how hard and difficult that it was to probably try to stay focused for that game, right? With all the emotions that was still riding high from, you know, the big comeback and everything like that. I feel like this was something very similar based off of another similar win versus the exact same team um, being Boston. So you couldn't help but to think about that coming in. Um, Nonetheless, um, I think that it definitely was a major part um, by the fact that, you know, because of who did not play in this game, you know, the, we always talk about how the, the styles make the fights and, and the styles mm-hmm. make the matchups and things like that. Um, we know that we've p- always played Boston relatively, you know, well, um, similarly with Milwaukee. The thing I've noticed is when we typically play Milwaukee, well, it's about mm-hmm. trying to defend that you know, MVP and, and, and defensive player of the year, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Mm -hmm. I never really understood why or how Onyeka Okongwu um, defends him as well as he does, but I don't be trying to ask no questions about how it works as long as it works. Well, it didn't have a chance to work tonight um, because he was not, you know, um, able to play. Uh, on tonight and I think that a big part of that is obviously because of the lack of help in the front court right yeah not just from a defensive standpoint on Giannis but even the ability to score where you do have an opportunity to put on Yeka in there from time to time that can not just yeah. make it difficult for Giannis on defense but also on the offensive side obviously no Jalen Johnson and uh Quinn mm-hmm. Snyder the head coach definitely mentioned um in the post game press conference about how they're just so freaking big um and that they're hard to guard especially on the perimeter because they have so many guys with size that can step out and shoot and create plays for you and extend plays right. sometimes so um you know as as much of more of a small forward as he probably is even Sadiq mm-hmm. Bay can be in very much in that same conversation Agreed. a guy that's Agreed. very physical defensive minded and plays bigger than he is so i think it was really all about the guys who didn't play on tonight more so um than the guys who did play honestly yeah i think that's a great call starting with Onyeka Okongwu the obvious i always say he kind of is one of the few players who lives rent free in Giannis Antetokounmpo's head, but he does. Because no anytime he plays, he always affects the game. And I think, like you said, if we break it down to its basics, it's the fact that he can bang in there a little bit better than Clint Capella, just for no other reason because of his girth. I mean, that's what Anyeka can do. But in addition, he's a little bit more athletic. And Giannis is a pretty athletic big man. So to have someone in there whose size is a little bit more complimentary to Giannis' size, coupled with the fact that his athleticism is about right there with him as well. I think that that's a lot of how he's been able to be successful, double O, not just against Giannis, but against many of the big men in the league. But yeah, anytime we're talking about a Hawks win against the Milwaukee Bucks, typically we're looking down the box score and we're saying, okay, what did Onyeka do? What did Giannis not do? And I look back at that first game, right? The first game of the year, where Onyeka had what? 
14 points, mm -hmm. seven rebounds, two mm -hmm. assists, and a steal. And you look at Giannis's numbers, people may not realize this. They may think, okay, 26 and 11, but this is Giannis. Like Giannis can go off at any given time. 26 and 11 is a nice game by Giannis along with two blocks and three assists in that first game. But ultimately speaking, that's still kind of containing Giannis, right? So yeah, that's where you miss him. And then Jalen, as Jalen's game has gotten better and as his defensive game has become more sound, he's also been able to get in there and kind of bang and bring some help and where that becomes important when you kind of look down to your point at the box score and you kind of see uh, Chris Middleton and what he's able to do in that small forward position technically but what he's able to do that's when you also miss out on an, a Jalen Johnson and a Sadiq Bay because number one you're missing out on a guy who can defend him in Jalen Johnson and also Sadiq Bay to, to some extent and you're missing out on the points that you can get from uh, Sadiq Bey. And yes, DeAndre Hunter has done a solid job for you, but DeAndre kind of had a middling night tonight as far as on the defensive side of the ball. So yeah, I think the inactive roster for the Hawks probably tells a lot of the story for them. And on the flip side, the active roster, that's my takeaway, the active roster for the Bucks actually tells the story for them because I always say, although Damian Lillard, didn't play for personal reasons tonight. Really, the guy who's always been that X factor for the Bucks, even before Dame Lillard, was always Chris Middleton. If Chris Middleton played, typically speaking, the Hawks were going to lose the game. Chris Middleton plays twice in the three games this season, the Hawks lose them both, right? And Chris Middleton's numbers are never numbers that are out of this world, right? Tonight, a solid night for Chris. 21 points, six rebounds, six assists. But it's the way that he affects the game. It, it it definitely always goes above and beyond just his stat line. So when I saw that Chris Middleton was playing tonight, I said, Ooh, this might kind of be a long night for the home team because that's just what he kind of does for them. And then another one, Patrick Beverly. Here's the thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pat Bev will probably remain on the questionable uh, status, under questionable status on the injury list for the remainder of the season because – Here's a guy in Pat Bev who has a wrist injury, right? That is yeah. supposed to take him out of the game for three to four months. No, not Pat Bev. Pat Bev plays. And then yeah, not only does sure. he play, but Pat Bev, who wasn't even supposed to pick up a basketball until midsummer, gets 18 points, five rebounds, five assists, a steal, and a block, and of course, he was a little bit of a pest for Fernando Bruno. And if you watch the broadcast, you would know how I called him that because the referee <laughs> insisted on remixing that man's name tonight. Like he I know, I this know, right by Bruno, man. But ultimately speaking, Patrick Beverly is another one. When he's in the game, his stat line doesn't always talk about how he affects the game, and sometimes it's just for him being a little bit pesky and being in places when he's not supposed to or getting fouls that maybe get called, maybe don't get called, but more importantly, they just kind of, I don't know, Pat Bev just lives in folks' heads rent-free. No, yeah. he de he definitely does. And I was even going to ask you if you're a, b beyond the fact that, you know, he doesn't play for the Hawks, if you're a, if you're, if you're a, Pat Bev kind of girl, you know, he's, he's not for oh, yeah, everybody, yeah, you know? Oh, I'm good. Yeah. 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 Are, are we gonna... <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're fine. No, no, no. It's just something about that, you know, that Chicago background and just the toughness and the mentality that comes along me. with it. And yep. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I kind of wish that we had something similar to that. Maybe not Pat Bev himself, right. but something similar. Yes. Um, I'm but Pat Bev Ilk. There we go. Of, of Pat Bev Elk. You always find a way to have the perfect words for everything. But, you know, the other thing that I kind of noticed about this team and it is, is even though, you know, when you're looking at the bench scoring, I think 24 points or somewhere around that range yeah, by both yeah. teams. So it kind of cancels out there. Um, but as much size as Milwaukee, you know, proposed problems and challenges for Atlanta, mm -hmm. they only out rebounded Atlanta by one point. They only scored two more points in the paint than Atlanta did. So I think you kind of got to give a little bit of credit because, you know, had you been watching that game, it certainly didn't feel that way. But I think one of the more bigger indictments for Atlanta in this situation is when you combine the two guys in the front court, one a starter, one not, 
with Clint Capella with 10, uh, I'm sorry, with eight rebounds. And then, of course, you have Bruno Fernando with four. That's 12 rebounds. If you take Bogey Bogdanovich, who is a a guard on all accounts, yeah. and add that with um, with DeJounte Murray, they had more rebounds than the, cen- than, than the center position yeah. altogether. By the way, also had more position, more uh, rebounds than even if you throw DeAndre Hunter in there, yep. which by default is a, a four man in a small lineup like this too. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I think that that was something else that was a little bit telling for me, and and right. and that I was slightly disappointed in with the bigs. If you're, if we know Br- Bruno and and Clinton's are going to give us, you know, a plethora of scoring, but when it comes to those rebounds, and typically Clint does, when it comes to those rebounds, I I, I gotta honestly have just just a little bit more. Yeah, you guys stay with us because, Deshaun, I want to go back to that. We're going to talk a little bit about DeJounte Murray more in that next segment. But I want to go back and kind of add to that a little bit about what you've said about Bogdan Bogdanovich because I think it does speak volumes to some of the things that we noticed, not just in this particular game, but in this homestand and this stretch overall. But I think the other piece is this. And listen, Deshaun and I are never like ref killers on this show. We don't make excuses. But it's hard to kind of overlook that stat line when you see that the Hawks only lost this game by nine points and you see the fact that the Bucks got to the line and were able to shoot 35 free throws to the mm. Hawks 18. I mean, that's the kind of stat line you kind of can't overlook, even though you're not supposed to be, and we're not making excuses. That's that almost is a double bit troublesome. Yeah, because the percentage actually goes in the Hawks' favor, Deshaun. 83% of the Hawks' free throws were made versus 80% of the Bucks. But if you get 35 and you're almost, like you said, doubling what the other team does, eventually that's probably going to get you the W. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more, like I said, about DeJounte Murray and the fact that even though five had an average night, you got an L, but maybe you shouldn't have. We'll talk about it in the end one. This episode of our Locked on Hawks postcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. So let's think about this, guys. To come back from a 21-point deficit, even if the Hawks fell short, you still have to have some passion and some drive, and you've got to be patient to keep getting that lead down until you get it down to five. That's how you win games or you at least stay competitive, and that's what happens when you have the passion, drive, and patience to keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and of course, some really, really funky seat covers. Whether you're into speed, power, or maybe style like myself, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guarantee Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. And of course, eBay Guarantee Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Sean, let's go back to the conversation that you started with DeJounte Murray. He, of course, scored 28 points, eight rebounds, and 12 assists on the night. And as you mentioned, Bogdan Bogdanovich, 38 points, 10 rebounds, four assists, and a steal on the night. Backcourt putting in absolute work tonight at Mm -hmm. both ends of the court. And we understand that sometimes it's going to be that kind of night. Now, offensively, that's not a big deal, right? Because it was a balance. This was a night where DeJounte Murray just had, we'll call it average now for DJ 20 points <laughs> and Bogdan was shooting the lights out of the building tonight. But when we're talking about boards and giving opportunities for second chance points and limiting second chance points for the other team, that's a conversation you and I should be talking about with the front line. But what I think this shows sometimes when this happens is that you have a situation where maybe it reminds you, Deshaun, that this roster does still have holes in it. It it, it does. And, you know, the that's the thing is like you need someone to be able to step in, you know, because we, we know that DeJounte has been carrying the load. Um, of this team I was listening to I think it was coming out of the half um, Mm -hmm. the assistant coach in Mike Bray which you could kind of tell even it was expected kind of going in that this was going to be a team that kind of had the heavy legs and kind of 
maybe a little bit of a feel where there's going to be stints right. or instances or you know possessions where it was like they were running out of gas and even then they right. were still fighting the only mm -hmm. thing as you know when we start previewing the next game the only thing i ask is just to fight sometimes the roster is better sometimes the talent is longer on the bench or whatever but just standing in there and fighting and giving you your all and that's something that they did but you know when when there is a situation where dejounte murray has been playing out of his mind this whole week and everything else who is the next person that's the that's the question for me who is the next guy not you know this isn't an instance that happens very often but just in case type of situations and scenarios you got to have somebody else that's in position to say you know what we're yeah. going to him and we're relying on him yes they i feel like they got not necessarily lucky um but the contribution that bogey brought on tonight is not something i feel like you can expect every single time dejounte murray has his, has an average game yeah like i need to know who that next guy is the contribution sometimes even from the bench because you're sometimes lucky to get what you're getting out of windler you're lucky yeah. to get anything you're getting out of matthews you're lucky to get anything you're getting coming up from, from the other matthews you're lucky to get anything that you're getting you know what i'm saying from all of bruno sometimes who's been playing with crazy energy mm -hmm. um but it, it's it's kind of like it's 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 just it's really tough because you don't yeah. have another scoring threat that you can count on night in and night out when you have these type of injuries and that's something that's very unfortunate but i right. certainly hope you know a solution is found relatively sooner than later but i think that's why you probably called out when we talked about this a couple nights ago and you're looking at the ncaa tournament and you're mm. watching some players who could be viable for the hawks in the draft and I asked you and I said, wow, Deshaun, I was kind of shocked because you and I talk about the front line, particularly the center position so much and how that's probably a big need for the Hawks. But for the sure. guys you were looking at were guards yeah. and really guards that equal points. I mean, they're one of the same in my mind. So I think you make an excellent point, no pun intended. But when you think about Kobe Bufkin, that's kind of what they were looking at with him. Like, hey, we need somebody who when Trey is taking a break, can come in and score buckets. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons, in addition to him ratcheting up his defense from his days with the Skyhawks, but that's one of the reasons that you get a guy like that as a guard. So I think great point that, you know me, I've said this on another one of our Locked On podcasts, and I'm going to say it again here. I actually was like, oh, God, Hawks, don't be too good down this stretch because if you are, then maybe your front office is going to think you're good and they shouldn't be making big moves, but they right. need to make a big move. I right. think this is a, a reminder without the Hawks being awful because they did not play awful this, this game. But this is a reminder that there are still holes in the roster. Mm -hmm. This is a reminder mm -hmm. that if you have three or four of your offensive weapons going down because Sadiq Bey, off that that's a two-way weapon, but let's talk about the offense, the three-pointer in mm -hmm. particular. Let's talk mm -hmm. about Jalen Johnson with not just his mid-range shot, but him starting to get confidence on history. And it goes without saying when you lose Trey Young. I mean, I'm not going to even have that conversation. For so sure. I think you make an excellent point about the fact that you need scoring in addition to defending. And that may be something that this game reminds the Hawks front office. You have holes in that roster, and that might dictate where you go in the draft to get points in the draft, but in free agency, maybe you go and get somebody who can defend against the other team scoring points. Now I was looking at this game as well from a different lens and kind of saying, Hey, this is a game that had interesting breakdowns. Like each quarter kind of was like a game unto itself, especially if you look back at the first quarter and how it started. So I'm going to do a little rapid fire for you. And I want you to give me your reaction on how you felt the Hawks played in that quarter, starting with the first period. The Hawks opened the game going three of four from three, and they led 12 to six after about two and a half minutes. What'd you think? Felt great about it. I, 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 I think that, you know, when you're playing up against a team like a Milwaukee Bucks, you got to come out striking out, you know, early and very, very hot. So yes. that's something where I definitely give them the check, the green check mark, where I felt really confident about, you know, them being able to take care of business up to that point. Same, because I was encouraged thinking, oh, maybe after so many games where they had to absolutely exert so much effort, maybe yep. they don't have tired legs like we thought until the second quarter, Deshaun. Mm -hmm. Hawks were four from 17 from the field and 0 for 6 from 3 to begin that second quarter. All of a sudden, they found themselves down 14. 
Yeah, that's that that's tough. I, I'll be honest with you. With, with what I kind of took away from much of that was that um the Hawks offense and defense never really got on the same page at the same time. Yeah. I feel like where you know there were instances where they got stops when they needed scoring, but then they got scoring when they were struggling to get stops right yeah. they didn't shoot poorly in this game i think 45 percent from field 40 percent mm -hmm. from three and 80 some right. percent which i always love from the free throw yeah, line yep. but the shots that they needed to fall in the moments that they needed them to fall the most is when they were not falling indeed indeed and then you go to the third quarter that pesky third quarter the hawks lost the third quarter but here was the thing that was weird they lost it but they shot five of nine from three. The Bucks only shot one of seven from three. How, Sway? How do you lose that quarter? Yeah, 50% shooting. But I think they did so much making up from the second quarter to a degree because in the second quarter is where they shot 27% from the field, zero uh, three-pointers that they converted on. So I feel like they kind of tried to make up for it a little bit in the third quarter. Um, as well as they played, it was definitely some making up that they had to do from the second quarter for sure. Indeed, indeed. And then you look at that fourth and final quarter. The Hawks battled back from a 21-point deficit to get it within five. It was about a little under eight minutes left in regulation. Yeah, I think at that point, you know, the the, the legs were kind of setting in a little bit. You know, yeah. that the, you, you started, you know, Bruno definitely provided a bit of a spark and whatnot and tried to re-energize the guys, kind of feeding them down low a little bit, working hard like a workhorse, construction hard hat, lunch pail type of guy and all that kind of stuff um bringing some of that energy and whatnot hungry hungry hippo feed me feed me feed me um but after the bucks kind of got that under control with all the size that we were talking about from going back to the beginning of this postcast i think that's where it kind of started to wear down on the hawks just a little bit and if you're gonna find somebody to try and beat you it has to be buggy bogdanovich but he can't do it by himself and unfortunately the the, the bucks were just had a little bit too much going for themselves with size and rest and just the scoring opportunities yeah. and everything like that. It was just a little bit too much for the Hawks to be able to make a run back. The Hawks are looking to do something Monday that they have not done all season. We'll talk about it on the other side and who's got next. This episode of our Locked on Hawks postcast is brought to you by Nissan and also by Amazon Fire TV. Now, are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. And the 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Pathfinder. It has room up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capability, and has 284 horsepower and up 6,000 pounds towing. So when Adventure Calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. And the Armada, much the same. It is exactly what you expect from a full-size SUV. Seats 8 does it in luxury and style. And you can explore further in the 2024 Armada. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com for more details. Now let's talk a little bit about Amazon Fire TV. It's your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewer experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV, whether it's opening weekend for baseball, woohoo, or the college basketball tournament, which is winding down to the Elite Eight. You're going to, to have a Fire TV Yes, you knew Deshaun was going to shout that one out and he'll be watching on his Fire TV just like I will be as well. Now, Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for 
free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. And to learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. So Deshaun, this has really been a good home stand for the Hawks. They went four and one. They nearly mounted a comeback tonight that would have given them an undefeated record. Before we talk Chicago, what stood out to you about this home stand in this stretch? I thought it was just a really good feel overall, you know, yeah. like I, I I don't think that tonight's game was is, is taking anything away from what they had already accomplished. Yep. Um, if, if anything, I think it really just kind of built on what they had already accomplished. If I have a bigger concern, it's probably one that I'm kind of somewhat happy to uh to have which is guys are tired because guys are working hard guys aren't tired you know guys if we're talking about guys feeling well rested and everything else then we'd be having a whole different conversation i think that there would be a problem there and then the record wouldn't reflect to look the way that it does either so um i, I think that there's some positivity there certainly quite a bit of it if i'm just being honest and um you know there's no reason for this fan base nor the team to you know hang their heads or bury their heads in their laps or in their hands or anything. I see Jamal Martin, appreciate him for uh, checking in with us and tapping into the program as always yeah. saying, I'm glad that they didn't give up throughout the game. Couldn't have asked for a better week from the Hawks at home. And again, I will always remind people to Nietzsche that this is a Hawks team that prior to this week had been pretty questionable with some of the, many of their games this year at home much better on the road for them to come back and kind of defend, you know, home court and whatnot, if for not nothing else, but just for these four or five games in a row, when you're at the bottom of the bottom in terms of, you know, playing at home and whatever, representing that state farm arena, there's nowhere. The only optimism there is, is to go up is to yeah. improve. And I think that they did that, but not only did that, they did it significant, significantly. And I think you can tell by looking at the, uh, the four and one overall record at home. And they did it with some players that needed to have extra minutes for Quinn Snyder to evaluate them to determine whether or not they should be a part of the squad for 2024-25. Right now, whether we like to hear it or not, pretty much everybody on this team on some level is under evaluation, right? But there are players in particular who maybe we haven't seen a lot of or for whatever reason. I'll take Bruno Fernando as an example, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It took Onyeka Okongwu being out Clint Capella going down for a little while and on some level, even not having Jalen Johnson there for you to be able to see Bruno and see him in minutes that actually mattered. So that will inform Quinn Snyder on, is this one of the guys that I want as a part of my second unit for next year? So I think this is also a great stretch of ball where you had to see what those individuals were bringing to the table, along with the Matthews boys, like, Wesley Garrison are those guys that would actually be viable to bring back for the second unit for next year. A beat he's another guy who really slowly but surely has contributed some very meaningful minutes that they pulled in from the College Park Skyhawks. So I think that's one of the things that stood out for me for this homestand. Now you have a bigger sample size for Quinn Snyder to choose from and for Landry Fields to evaluate to determine which of these guys can be some of those role players that we so desperately need for next year. Should we have another one of those years where you have a rash of injuries or you look at players like Clint Capella and say, hmm, is there any opportunity to keep him or is it time for us to move on? And you're looking at more of a Clint Capella that's, 100% uh, or closer CC that's closer to 100% than not. So I definitely think that those are some things that I took away, like you said, that were positive, even in the loss, because you still played a very good game. You just fell a little bit short tonight. Now, one game the Hogs can't fall short on if they intend to possibly even sneak into the ninth spot in the East is this Monday game at the Bulls. Now, the good thing is, Deshaun, they're going into Chicago and they're going to be playing a team in the Bulls who's literally going to be on a back-to-back. -back. So that could play in the Hawks' favor. This no is doubt. A, a, a Chicago Bulls team that 
Last season, these teams went back and forth. You remember when we were talking about all of the buzzer beaters, if you will, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it was just like you never knew which team was going to win. But this year, the games that they've already played, those games have gone in the Bulls' favor. But again, the Bulls uh, played the Nets and lost. The Bulls will play the Wolves tomorrow night, and they're at Minnesota, and then they come back home Monday to take on these Hawks. So how can the Hawks maybe take advantage of that? How can the Hawks get this win? Well, first of all, I feel confident about it because they're not playing up against the number one or number two team in the East. If they were, I would probably still feel pretty confident about it because they did so well against both of those teams <laughs> this week. Fair. But I think the I think the other thing is, is that it's a team that is very similar within record and amongst other things um, to the Atlanta Hawks. So that has to give a little bit of a, you know, a pretty good feel. I think the Hawks are still going to come out with that competitive edge, still yeah. feeling like there's things that they need to prove um, a little bit. And, um, you know, we were talking about them being so close within the race between ninth seeds and 10 seeds and things like that. So I think mm-hmm. it would be nice to flex the muscles. But if I'm just being honest, the thing I want to see the most rest, like if you don't do anything else, you fly into Chicago, whatever, one hour time difference, whatever, what have you. It's not going to be played for at least about another, two, you know, 48 hours or so, roughly. Um, and to just do some walkthroughs. I'm not even sure yeah. I want guys really practicing for real. Come yeah. in your sweats. Let's just do some walkthroughs, some simple stuff. But I really think it's important to kind of rest beyond anything else and get ready to prepare for a much tougher stretch. And just hopefully you can kind yeah. of stay healthy until guys get back. I would have to say the same. I think that Quinn Snyder has been excellent at strategizing that where, hey, we'll get a notification saying they're not doing shoot rounds and understandably so. This team has absolutely been taxed top of the roster to the bottom this entire week. They deserve a break. Locked on Sports Atlanta is the number one place to hang out after every game, just like Jamal did tonight. We appreciate him and all you guys for stopping by. Remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, for more on the Hawks, check out the Locked on Hawks podcast with our guy brad roland we will see you monday night